Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, and I'm really excited today to be exploring one of my favorite habitats for wild mushrooms. This will be conifer rich woods. So, all around me are a bunch of eastern white pine trees, red pine trees, and Norway spruce trees. And I've had a lot of luck in the past, especially mid autumn. So hopefully I can repeat some of those successes today. So if you have a few minutes, allow me to introduce you to some wild mushrooms that you may or may not be familiar with. Here we have one of the most well-known, one of the most illustrated mushrooms in the entire world. Whatever many people think of the term wild mushroom, usually they're not thinking of oyster mushrooms or shiitake mushrooms or white button mushrooms, but maybe they're thinking of the fly agaric mushroom, the one that's featured in mythology and pop culture even on Christmas cards. See that classic red and white toadstool mushroom? Well, this is a variety of it. So it's not red and white or deep red and white like you might see in many of those other Amanita muscaria mushrooms, just because this is a different variety that grows where I live. And worldwide, there are a lot of different varieties of Amanita muscaria. But basically, we can categorize them into three main groups or three main clades based on geographical location. So there's a Eurasian clade, there's a Eurasian subalpine clade, then there's a North American clade. And here in North America, there are at least eight varieties or eight different taxa, so different names for Amanita muscaria. And it seems that the original Amanita muscaria originated in the humid temperate forests of Beringia in the late tertiary period, millions of years ago, and then perhaps about 12 million years ago, it crossed some land bridges to get over here in North America and spread itself out. Now, if you're hunting where I live in northwestern Pennsylvania or somewhere in northeastern North America, you find a yellow-orange variety summer through fall especially in association with conifer trees, and you're probably looking at Amanita muscaria, and the variety is Gisawii. So where the heck does Gisawii come from? What does that even mean? Well, it comes from a German-born botanist who worked for the Ottawa Experimental Farm in the early 1900s, and his name was Hans Theodor Gisau. So that's where the name comes from. And this is a medium to large size mushroom. Now, there are a couple key identifying features for this mushroom, so you don't confuse it for anything else. Usually it has these patches on its cap, and these patches are from the universal veil, which is a structure that covered this mushroom whenever it was young. And then another feature of this mushroom is whenever you look at the bottom of this mushroom, you will see that there are concentric rings around the base of the stalk. So this is very unique for this mushroom. You don't really see it in too many other mushrooms unless they're part of that Amanita muscaria group. So look for those concentric rings. Usually you'll see between two and four. Oftentimes I see about three, but sometimes I'll see a little more than that. Many times you'll see a partial veil or a little ring around the stem as well, but sometimes it falls off and it disappears completely. And this mushroom has white gills, and these gills are free from the stem or just very narrowly attached to the stem. And like all Amanita mushrooms, this one, Amanita muscaria, the variety Gisawii, drops a white spore print. So you can see a little Amanita muscaria mushroom right here just forming, and I brought one of the original ones down here so I can show you the concentric zones of the universal veil tissue right around this enlarged base right here. You can see the partial veil remnant on the stem. And you can see the patches deposited on this cap right here. So all signs point to Amanita muscaria and because of where I live, because of this color, the variety is Gisawii. Now, whenever you look at the mycochemistry of Amanita muscaria, including this one, you see that there are two very fascinating compounds found within the fungus. One is known as ibotenic acid, another one is known as muscimol, and it seems that a lot of the ibotenic acid can be converted into muscimol through a process known as decarboxylation. And muscimol seems to affect various neurotransmission systems within the body, specifically by altering neuronal activity within many areas of the brain. And so it's no surprise that muscimol is being studied in its role in treating various neurological disorders, including epilepsy and also Parkinson's disease. And if these two compounds sound fascinating to you, specifically muscimol, do more research and see what you uncover. Now, this is a very important mushroom in the habitats where it grows because it's an ectomycorrhizal mushroom and it forms symbiotic relationships with various tree species. And it benefits the trees. The trees are also benefiting this fungus right here. And so I tend to find it in association with conifer trees, specifically eastern white pine trees, but you also see it in association with oak trees and other deciduous trees. And many times you find this growing in very large numbers specifically in fairy rings. So it's not uncommon to find this mushroom summer through fall where I live, but its season might extend depending on where you live. And I encourage you to get out and look for an Amanita muscaria mushroom where you live. If you don't live in the Northeastern United States, that's okay, you might have a different variety. But if you are in the Northeastern United States, get out right now and look for Amanita muscaria, the variety Gisawia, one of the most beautiful and a very important fungus found in our woodlands. Okay, so as I was walking away from the Amanita muscaria mushrooms, I immediately saw some other mushrooms that really caught my attention. And they might have some association with Amanita muscaria. And I'll tell you about that in a second. 
but it's this little small terrestrial bolete like mushroom right here. This is the cap of another one. This one belongs to the genus Chalciparus. Chalciparus means copper colored pores because the pore surface you can see is kind of copper colored. Now this one is most likely Chalciparus piperatoides because the pore surface bruises bluish or blackish. You can see that in the bottom really well right here. Whereas Chalciparus piperatus, which is a lookalike, doesn't really turn bluish black on the bottom like these ones right here. Now this one has a peppery taste. Maybe bite into it chew for a couple seconds and spit it out because the edibility of this one is unknown, you get that peppery sensation. And that is due to a compound known as chalciparone, which is an alkaloid that has antimicrobial properties as well. And so as I said before, this is a terrestrial-like bolete mushroom, pretty small, but it is found in association with Amanita muscaria because newer research suggests that this mushroom right here, chalciparus, probably is parasitic on the mycelium of Amanita muscaria, which is really, really fascinating because most bolete-like mushrooms are mycorrhizal. They form those mutualistic relationships with various plant and tree species, but perhaps Chalciparus, Chalciparus piperatoides, and maybe Chalciparus piperatus, they have parasitic tendencies in association with the mycelium of Amanita muscaria. So that's really, really fascinating. Another key identifying feature for this, whenever you look at the base of the stalk, you'll see that there is yellow mycelium. That's pretty characteristic for many Chalciparus species. So this is Chalciparus, most likely piperatoides because the pore surface bruises bluish, blackish. This is maybe not an edible mushroom, but who really knows because the edibility is unknown, but it's a fascinating fungus. Look for it in association with Amanita muscaria mushrooms. If you're hunting mushrooms in conifer-rich woods, then be on the lookout for this edible bolete mushroom. So this one is specifically known as the bay brown bolete, Imlaria badia. And it's gone through several name changes over the years. It used to be called Xerocomus badius and also Boletus badius. But as of late 2014, its newest name is Imlaria badia, named after the Belgian mycologist Louis Imler. And this one's pretty common in the northeastern half of North America. You also see it in Central Europe. As I mentioned, looking conifer-rich woods, and sometimes you'll even see it fruiting from eastern hemlock stumps or logs or thick branches on the forest floor. So there's a couple ways to positively identify this fungus. Notice the bay brown color of the cap, that brownish cap color. Also on the underside, you will see that the yellowish pore surface bruises a grayish bluish color. It's not always so apparent, but in most of the specimens that I find, it'll bruise this bluish or this grayish color. The stalk is pretty firm and solid, and while it's not netted, doesn't have any reticulation to it, it's not completely smooth either. It almost has these reddish brown streaks all up and down the stalk. Now, as I mentioned, this is an edible mushroom, so you can definitely bring it home and cook it up. I know it sounds kind of weird when you say inedible or inedible, but you can eat this mushroom, and it tastes pretty good. And so even if you bite into it raw, spit it out. It should be mild. It should not be bitter. It should not be peppery. If it's one of those flavors, then it's probably not the Bay Brown Bolete. You can use it like you would use your Porcini or your Boletus edulis mushrooms. It can be that good. Now, there's at least one study showing that this mushroom has medicinal properties. There's a study published in the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms in 2016 showing that extracts had anti-inflammatory properties. However, they used mouse cells and not human cells. However, the results still seem promising. I guess the only downside about this mushroom is that it tends to accumulate a lot of metals from the soil, specifically arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. This species is well susceptible to contamination with radiocesium. So if you live in an area with a lot of defective nuclear power plants, or if you live in an area that has experienced power plant disasters, I would probably not harvest anything in that area, but specifically this mushroom, because it really accumulates radiocesium. However, if you're harvesting in a pristine area, and where I'm harvesting right now, it's a pretty pristine area, I don't mind harvesting many of these mushrooms right here. So this is the Bay Brown Bolete Imlaria badia, an edible mushroom that can be found summer through fall in conifer-rich woods. So right now I'm going to introduce you to a somewhat obscure mushroom. The more you look for it, the more that you're likely to find it, especially if you're hunting mushrooms in conifer-rich woods. And it's this three inch tall mushroom right here. It's kind of straw colored or tan colored. I've got two more right here coming up out of this moss. This beautiful little mushroom belongs to a genus known as Cystoderma. You ever hear of Cystoderma before? And the species name is Amianthinum. So Cystoderma Amianthinum just rolls right off your tongue, right? And so let's look at that Latin name for a second. So Cystoderma means blistered skin, perhaps because the cap kind of has granules on it and the lower portion of the stem is somewhat shaggy. 
and then amianthinum means pure or unsullied, perhaps because the top portion of the stem is actually completely smooth. So this mushroom does have a ring or a ring zone, and above that it's smooth, and then below that you will see that it's shaggy. So those are key features for this mushroom. Now, Cystoderma is a genus of saprophytic mushrooms, so they break down plant material. So even though you see it coming up terrestrially out of the soil, it's breaking down a lot of this stuff and a lot of this leaf litter. And this specific one, Cystoderma amianthinum, typically grows under conifers. So that's where you're very, very likely to find it. If you look in the underside, you'll see that there are pure white gills. This mushroom does drop a white spore print. And those gills are directly attached to the stem. Now, this helps to separate it from some lookalikes. Somebody might confuse this for a Lepiota mushroom, and Lepiotas typically have free gills, so the gills don't directly attach themselves to the stem. Or somebody might confuse this for a very small Amanita mushroom, but most Amanitas do have free gills, so the gills don't attach themselves to the stem. And also at the bottom of many Amanitas, you'll see an enlarged base or a vulva or a sac at the bottom of those stems. You don't see it at the bottom of this. It's just completely straight all the way down. Now, this one isn't known to be poisonous, but nobody's really harvesting this for the table. You don't really find a whole lot of them. And they're very, very small, so they probably cook down to nothing. So I do not recommend eating or bringing home this mushroom for any edible purposes. However, it's a beautiful mushroom to find. I encourage you to get out there and look in conifer rich woods for Cystoderma amianthinum. And I believe one of the common names is the earthy powder cap mushroom. Okay, so I have one more good one for you. So I hope you have time to learn about this particular fungus right here. So not the lichen right here, which does involve a fungus, but we're talking about this and these over here. So it kind of looks like a turkey tail mushroom. Maybe you're saying, why are you teaching us about turkey tail again? You talk about turkey tail every other video. Well, it's turkey tail look-alike. So if you're interested in finding one of the most medicinal fungi in the world, which is Trimetes versicolor, the turkey tail fungus, don't confuse it for this one. Now, this is not a poisonous mushroom. It's just one of its look-alikes. So it looks like turkey tail on the top with the multicolored concentric zones of varying colors, kind of thin and leathery, but the underside, you see that it has gill-like structure. So it kind of looks like an oyster mushroom from the bottom. Look how beautiful that is. And these ones are really, really fresh. You'll find these in the wintertime as well. It'll overwinter and it'll dry up and when it's really fresh, these really feel like true gills right here. But this is in the polypore family, so it's kind of considered a polypore mushroom. And so this one is related to turkey tail, so it's Trimetes betulinus, also known as Lenzites betulina. You're going to find both names in field guides. And betulina refers to its growth on birch, maybe originally when it was first discovered, but it actually it can be found on a variety of different substrates. So it's not just birch forest where you're going to look for it. You'll find an oak forest. I'm in a conifer forest right here. And so you'll find this mushroom. It's very, very common. Again, it looks like turkey tail on the top, but it's got these gill-like structures. Not very thick, not very hard. I mean, it really feels like oyster gills right here. And this is the gilled polypore. That's one of its common names, and there are many common names for this fungus. Now, if you would happen to make medicine out of this one, it's not a poisonous or a deadly mistake or anything. In fact, there has been some research on this. A study published in the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms in 2014 found that ethanol extracts, so alcohol extracts, had anti-cancer and antibacterial properties. It doesn't seem like there's any more medicinal research on it, but if I find any more, I'll be sure to update you with that information. And so this is the gilled polypore, one that'll confuse you if you just see the top and you don't see the bottom. Or if you just see the bottom, don't see the top, it can confuse you as well. So you really have to look at all sides for this one. Again, it's not the true turkey tail. The true turkey tail mushroom, Trimetes versicolor, has a pore surface on the bottom. So white pores on the bottom, not these gill-like structures. So get out there and see if you can find this particular fungus. Okay, so we covered a lot of information. We found a lot of different mushroom species, but I think the main point is that there are a lot of mushrooms to be found and discovered. There are a lot of mushrooms to be studied and a lot of mushrooms to be appreciated. And I encourage you always to get out there, look for mushrooms, learn the names of as many mushroom species as you can. Not only that, learn their ecological roles and see how they may benefit you either now or somewhere down the line. Thanks so much for watching this video. As always, I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.